Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. Well, I'm, t I'm in a very special place, and we're going to be talking about today what Satan saw on the day of Pentecost. And what a place to talk about this message in the very vicinity, not only where the Holy Spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 2 on the festival of Pentecost, but also in a place which is a mikvah. And I will be explaining to you what a mikvah is in just a moment. And there are scholars who do believe it's possible that I'm standing exactly in the spot where Peter baptized 3,000 converts on the day of Pentecost. Now, the first thing I want to do as we talk about this message today is sort of go back into the Old Testament and give you a foundational setting that leads us up to the event that happened in Acts chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. The first thing we want you to understand is the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the book of Genesis 1, 1, it says, in the beginning, God, that's God the Father. Verse 2, the earth is without form and void and darkness is upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. Verse 2 is what in, the phrase in Hebrew, Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit the Spirit of God is in verse 2. So you have the Father in verse 1, the Holy Spirit in verse 2. Then we come to verse 3, and it says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. That's an odd verse because light, as far as the cosmic lights of the heavens, the sun, moon, and stars, was not created until day 4 of creation. So what was the light of verse 3? In John's Gospel, John chapter 1, he talks about in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he talks about how that light was none other than Christ himself. That's the reason why Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Because Jesus Christ preexisted in the beginning with God the Father. So we have God the Father in verse 1, the Holy Spirit in verse 2, and the light, that early light of creation that expelled the darkness in verse 3 in Genesis. So we see that the Spirit of God shows up very early at creation. In fact, before the animals, the cosmic uh, lights of the heavens, and before man was created, God actually, through the Holy Spirit, appears right here on the planet, moving upon the face of the water. Now, because the Holy Spirit in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2 is moving upon the surface of the water, water becomes a theme of the Holy Spirit throughout both the Old and the New Testament. You know, Joel said, for example, in Joel 2, in the last days, God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Pouring out is a rain term. James chapter 5 talks about how the husbandman waits patiently for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he receives the early rain and the latter rain, a metaphor for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah talked about, I'll pour water upon him that's thirsty, floods upon dry ground. I will pour my spirit out upon thy offspring and my blessing upon your seed. And so Isaiah the prophet also talks about water. He uses the metaphor of water. So it's interesting in Bible theology, there's something called the law of first mention. And in the law of first mention, what it means is when you see a scripture, word, or symbolism especially alluded to in the first place in the Bible, it usually carries that theme throughout the Bible, law of first mention. For example, a serpent is a picture of Satan because a serpent appeared in the garden in Genesis chapter 3, tempting the first couple to disobey God. Revelation chapter 12, the last book of the New Testament, talks about Satan being like a great red dragon. The Greek word dragon there is the word for serpent. So the theme of the serpent is it represents either sin or Satan throughout the Bible. So water does, throughout Scripture, is used as a metaphor to either represent the Holy Spirit being poured out or the Holy Spirit in us. John chapter 7 says, Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. So the living water, again, represents the Spirit. And we go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, where water and the Spirit are connected together at the very beginning, carrying the th theme all the way through to the book of Revelation, where it says the Spirit and the bride say come, and it's talking about the water of life flowing 
from the city of God. So when we look at these verses in the Bible, we begin to understand that the Holy Spirit did not just come on the day of Pentecost, that he was actually present at creation from the very beginning of time. Now, when we later come into the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which is called the Pentateuch, uh, the Greek word is uh, for the five books of Moses, but in the Hebrew thought, it's called the Torah. We discover that the Spirit of God is activated and moving through those books. We come into, for example, how that God directed the patriarchs by his angel, the angel of the Lord, and also by the Holy Spirit, by God's word. We come into the time of Joshua and the judges and the kings, and we really see the activity of the Holy Spirit really beginning to increase in the lives of men. We read, for example, I think it's like 15 people in the book of Judges and all the way to the book, the historical books of the Bible. And it says, and the spirit of God came upon Gideon and the spirit of God came upon Jephthah. And the Spirit of God came upon Samson. Samson, for example, is one of those guys that really was moved on quite heavily by the Holy Spirit. Now, his gifting when the Spirit of God came on him was his strength. Uh, he, could, he could take the gates of Gaza and rip them off of their hinges and carry them up a hill. This guy was God's superman back in the time of ancient Israel's history. And so the Spirit of God would come upon people. But the, the thing that was missing was this. The thing that was missing is the Spirit of God coming in to abide in someone or to remain in them. And so in the Old Testament time, the Spirit of God would come on Samson and then it would lift from him. The Spirit of God would come on Gideon and then the Spirit would lift from him. So there was an unction or an anointing that were on these Old Testament prophets and saints, but the Spirit of God didn't necessarily come in an abiding setting. The abiding of the Holy Spirit in a person came when Jesus promised that he would send us another comforter that would abide with us forever. And he promised that the Holy Spirit would come, which leads us to where I am today. Now, I happen to be on what is called, uh, the, let's just do it this way. The Mount of Olives is over to my left. In front of the Mount of Olives is the Kidron Valley at the base of it. Then when you look up the walls of Jerusalem, you come to the Eastern Gate. Then you'll see when you pass the Eastern Gate, it's the Temple Mount platform. Now, back in the time of Jesus Christ, there was a temple that had been rebuilt by Ezra and uh, the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. And the platform that you're looking at now, which is the wall, which is directly behind me, you can see way up at the top, that's the Alaska Mosque, the top of it. And you can see this is the edge of the mosque. But right, right in front of that mosque are a set of steps called the Hulda Steps. Now, they existed back in the time of Jesus. So everything we're looking at, the old rock, this has all been excavated. This was under dirt. In 1967, all you saw was a mound of dirt through this entire area. None of this existed. And over the years we've been coming to Israel, they have been excavating. Well, one day as they excavated, they got to the bottom of the hill here on the slopes in the city of Jerusalem, and they found this massive, what is called a mikvah. Now, before I talk about the day of Pentecost, let me explain to you what a mikvah was. In the Old Testament time, let's say if you had been in the tabernacle of Moses or in the temple, and you were coming as a priest to minister to God, they had what was called a laver. This laver had water in it. And so what you did before you performed any ritual in the ministry was you had to wash your feet and wash your hands. And what this represented was uh, a sanctification process, what we call a ritualistic sanctification process to prepare you for ministry in God's presence. Now, this is important to understand. I'm going to give you a little practical teaching here. They offered a lamb in the morning and a lamb in the evening which meant that blood was on the altar in the morning and in the evening every day at the temple. This was an offering of not only appreciation to God, but to cover any kind of activity that would have happened that the people, that the priest, for example, would need a, a cleansing of. Blood in the morning, blood in the evening. The, the washing of the, of the water is significant because it's not a one-time washing. It was something you had to do every day. When you went into God's presence, you offered the blood, Lamb in the morning, lamb in the evening, and you also offered, uh, not offered, I'm sorry, you also washed the hands and the feet. The, the feet, of course, was where you were doing your duty. The hands was the, were the work that you did. Some even suggest that when they washed their hands, they would also wash their face. So the washing was every day. You know, the Apostle Paul talked about, I die daily. The process of walking with God, and this is very important, you hear this, is just not, hey, I got it, 
I'm walking with God. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's an everyday process. Every day there's cleansing processes. Every day there's applications of the blood of Jesus. Every day, uh, you know, the Bible, I guess I could say it this way. We, we, we wash ourselves daily or sanctify ourselves daily in the washing of the water of the word. So for people that just, you know, they say, I got saved, but they don't come to church in 10 years and never serve God, never follow God. They're missing something somewhere. But for people who love the Lord and follow the Lord, the washing process is extremely significant as the way I'm speaking of it right now. If we go back now to the time of the mikvah, what was the mikvah? Well, the mikvah, if, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you about Jerusalem here, the way Jerusalem was set up in the time of Jesus, there's something that they call them the twin pools. And they're actually under the Sister of Zion's church. There's these, these uh, miniature mikvah. And what a mikvah is, it's where they took the limestone rock and they cut a niche out of it. The niche, it depends on this one. I don't know how high this one was back in the day, but it couldn't be over a person's head. You had to come in and be able to dip down under the water. So I'm going to estimate that these were probably about four and a half feet or five feet. Of course, of course if the archaeologist was here, he could tell me exactly. The ones I've seen under the churches here that go back to the Roman time, what they are, are they are, they are you would go down steps and we can see right over here. I'm just going to go ahead and walk here, guys, if you're following with the camera. I'm going to walk over here. I surprise the cameraman sometime, but these are steps that originally went down into this mikvah. These are steps from the Roman time. So you would come down the steps here and then you would come into the water. When you got into the water, there was a man, and this is according to Jewish history I read, that would take his foot, put it on your head, and would sub submerge you all the way under, and then you would come back up. And of course, you would come through the waters, and then you would, you would then uh, take your clothes and come on into the temple area. Now, back in the time of Christ, right up here on top of the hill, you can't see it here, there's a double gate and a triple gate. And the double gate's where they went into the temple, triple gate is where they went out of the temple. So let's go back and talk about the water. Where did the water come from? There's no rivers in Jerusalem. But the water for the mikvah came from these pools, springs of water that are underneath the Temple Mount area, and they diverted part of them to the temple for the priests to do their washing at the laver and to also have water in the temple area itself. They diverted the other part to this big mikvah. This held huge amounts of water. And so what would happen is rainwater, there would be niches, and it would all drain down to a certain area coming to these mikvahs that were here, or the spring water would be stored up, and be, they, there would be an access through a channel for it to come into the mikvah. Like if it got real hot, didn't rain for a long period of time, the spring water was still here. Here. So these were filled with water. Now let's go back to the original subject, what Satan saw on the day of Pentecost. It, it's, a, it's a known fact that a spirit, whether it be uh, a demonic spirit or whether it be the Holy Spirit, any spirit has to have a body in which to work through. If you take a spirit and set it outside of a body, it's going to be very limited to what it can do. When a demon possesses a person, the person then can kill someone. Or if a demon possesses a person, the person then can rob someone or do something evil. Dictators, a lot of dictators in the past like Adolf Hitler were controlled by demon spirits. Now, the Holy Spirit's the same way. The Holy Spirit has to have a body in which to work. The Holy Spirit has to have a voice and it's the human voice in which to speak so we can speak as the oracles of God. So watch carefully. When Jesus takes his physical body and he's been raised from the dead and he goes to the top of the Mount of Olives, the first thing he tells his disciples is go into the city of Jerusalem and tarry until you be endued with power from on high in Luke 24. So his body is now in heaven. Now what is Jesus going to do in order to bring forth the message of the gospel with signs and wonders the way he did while he was on earth for 42 months? And the answer is this, the Holy Spirit is going to be sent from God in heaven to control the bodies of the individuals by what is called the baptism in the Holy Spirit or the infilling of the Spirit. So on the day of Pentecost, uh, the, 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 the believers are gathered together somewhere in a room in the temple called an upper room area or one of the areas of the temple, one of the rooms of the temple. And here's what we read in Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place in one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven like as a mighty rushing wind, filled all the house where they were seated. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. So immediately after Peter preached his message, 3,000 souls were saved. And then Peter talks about being baptized in water. Now, it had to be a mikvah. There are no rivers in Jerusalem. This is the closest one to the temple area, the closest one to the steps at least that's been found. And trust me, you could baptize 3,000 people in here in a short period of time. So in other words, this whole area right through here, you can see some of, some of this, of course, has been different occupations through history, history but this was the mikvah. You can see the, the old walls. All right, now, if this was a mikvah, which archaeologists say that it was, Peter would have brought the believers down here and baptized 
baptized them, and they would have been at that point uh, believers in Yeshua, believers in the Jewish Messiah, who also would become the Gentile Messiah. Now, can you see Peter down here and just see these multitudes up on these walls? Now, you got to remove some of these stones because some of these stones may go back to the Byzantine time or may go back to the Muslim time. Just picture this as a rock mountain and, and all, a, a, t a temple area, plat platforms at the top, and they're down here watching him, some with hate, some with animosity, and others are coming out rejoicing. And, you know, to, to think that you're standing where the church was born. This is the thing that just messes with me, that I'm standing right here where the church was born. 120, then 3,120, then later on 8,120. And now maybe 2 billion Christians around the world, and I'm standing. Guess what? I get to stand right here where it happened. You need to come on a whole in trip with me so I can show you some stuff. I'm going to tell you that right now. That's what I feel like telling you. So what did Satan do on the day of Pentecost? What did Satan see? This is what I believe. There's no biblical indication of what Satan saw, but Satan, I know, had his eyes on those believers up there trying to figure out what was going to happen because you understand the believers didn't know that the Spirit of God was coming and they would speak with tongues and they'd see cloven tongues as a fire. They didn't know that. So it's a surprise to them when all this happens. Jesus did tell them in, in Mark's gospel they would speak with new tongues. But see, no one knew the process. If the people didn't know the process, I can guarantee you one thing, Satan didn't know the process. So I, I like to picture it like this. Satan, the prince of the power of the air, he's got his eye on all the believers. He's trying to figure out what's going to happen. And all of a sudden, the festival of Pentecost comes. You've got the biggest crowd here. Uh, it's one of the main festivals that all men over 20 years of age has to attend. So there's tens and tens and tens of thousands of people. So when the day is fully come, meaning it's the moment to begin the celebrations at the temple, there's a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind. So it fills the place where they're seated. So all of a sudden, they hear this really weird sound. Now, you know, normally, I don't know if you know this or not, but when the bl wind blows, sometimes you can hear the sound from it. So it fills the whole place. Now, imagine what happened when tongues of fire start shooting out of the sky and hit inside the building, and it starts dancing on all these people. Now, I don't know if just the disciples saw the tongues of fire or others did, but there were tongues of fire. Then all of a sudden, 120 start speaking in languages they've never learned. This is what shocked the whole group. In the book of Acts chapter 2, there's about uh, 16 languages represented with these Galileans. These are just uneducated Galileans. They're not supposed to be doing this. They're now speaking in a language they've never heard. And then people are amazed. They're in doubt. People are calling it the wonderful works of God. Some are recognizing it as a fulfillment of prophecy, no doubt, from Joel chapter 2. But what did Satan see? Well, I can picture him in the atmosphere, and all of a sudden the power of God, the wind of the Holy Spirit blows by and kind of spins him around three times. And I always tell people, this is my message. I'll preach it like I want to, okay? And then all of a sudden, the principality over Jerusalem, Satan says, what on earth happened? He said, I don't know, but it's down there in that room. And by the time Satan got down there to examine real close what happened in the temple, Thomas comes skipping out, Mary comes shouting out, Peter came rolling out, and they were going nuts. And Satan said, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. Now, let me tell you why Satan was in trouble. Ready? Here's why Satan was in trouble. He thought when Jesus ascended to heaven that he'd got rid of Jesus. He thought that when Jesus went up back to the Father, that was the end of it. But now, Jesus has a body on earth. And the Spirit of God is going to work through that body. And what, what Satan found out in Acts 3, a lame man is healed. First of all, Acts 2, the Holy Spirit's poured out. Acts 3, a lame man is healed that had been laid daily at the temple. And Satan said, you know what? I thought I got rid of Jesus, but now i got a whole bunch acting just like him. And so the point is, that the believer, let, let me talk to you for a moment. There's people that believe in cessationism, which, which, which means that they think miracles have ceased, the gifts of the Spirit has ceased, speaking in tongues has ceased. Th these individuals are all over the world. And they think, you know, we have the Word of God. Thank God we do. And the Word of God is effective. And that's what we preach today. But let me tell you something. The Bible says, you need to hear this. God confirms His Word with signs, wonders, and miracles and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. If I go overseas to preach in an, at a foreign nation and I hold my Bible up and say, this is the Word of God, there'll be another religion out here that'll hold up their book and say, no, this is God's Word. And there'll be people in the Middle East that'll say, no, this is God's Word. And they'll hold up their own religious book. How do you prove that it's real? One of the ways you prove it's real, it's not the only way, is through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because when people are baptized in the Holy Spirit, their entire life changes. When people are baptized in the Holy Spirit, if they're drug addicts, they get delivered. If they're alcoholics, they get delivered. You have uh, 
prostitutes, strippers, or people that, that you know, had those kind of lifestyles their entire life, and all of a sudden they're totally, completely transformed. How do you explain the transformation of someone who was totally, totally bound up by something, and now they're completely free? It cannot be explained, to be quite honest with you. And so what I, want to, what I want to share with you is this. It is very important that you as a believer, once you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, Savior that you be baptized in the Holy Spirit, that you let the power of God come into your life, that you allow God to give you a prayer language to pray. And there's a, I could give you, and I don't have time, eight reasons just from the New Testament alone of praying in the Spirit and the purpose of praying with, with the Holy Spirit. But it's very, very significant and very, very important that you be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And when, when you become a believer, you become baptized in the Holy Spirit, all of that is a process that imparts you into what's called the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit, you are born of the Spirit into the body of Christ. And I'm not talking about a particular denomination because people are very denominationally oriented and, and they stand with their particular group and that's fine. But I'm talking about the universal body of Christ where every believer, believers in underground churches, believers that don't even have buildings in foreign countries, you're a part of the universal body of Christ. So what did Satan see on the day of Pentecost? He saw trouble. And every time, now you listen carefully, because Joel 2 and Acts 2 says the Holy Spirit will be poured out in the last days. Every time believers are baptized in the Holy Spirit today, it's a sign and an indicator that Jesus is coming soon. We've had over 100,000 people baptized in the Holy Spirit in our conferences. If you've never been to one of our weekend conferences across the nation, please plan on attending. Sunday night is always the greatest service of these conferences where hundreds at times receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So I want to encourage you, shake up the devil a little bit and be filled with the Holy Spirit and be empowered with power from on high. And it'll give you a prayer language to be able to glorify God and magnify His name in. Well, I'm here again from the city of Jerusalem from an old ancient mikvah. And I want you to stay with me for two reasons, a new offer and the fact that I have places I'm going to be coming to and some conferences coming up that I want you to attend. God bless you. Perry Stone is pleased to offer his newest landmark prophetic book for 2017, The Revelation Generation. This book has new research and special prophetic insight not found in any previous book or teaching from Perry. The new research includes the prophecies of the patriarchs, including Adam, Enoch, Jacob, Moses, and David that reveal last day events in the Hebrew scriptures. Perry explores the amazing end time prophecies in Jewish writings, such as the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Damascus document, and the first century BC Gabriel stone, recently discovered at the Dead Sea, which Perry personally saw while in Israel. Perry explains biblically-based rabbinical prophecies and how Christ could not have returned before 1948, as Christ's return is linked to Israel's complete restoration. He warns about an impending shaking coming to America based upon the six woes in Isaiah which will occur in our nation. Perry has researched 14 harbingers occurring in Israel, all pointing to Christ's return. He includes a chapter on prophecies concealed within the Jewish calendar, including a study in the Jewish month of Lyar. In the chapter titled, Biblical Numbers in the Hebrew Alphabet Reveal Election Codes, using the Torah reading that occurred in the synagogues before, during, and after Donald Trump's inauguration, Perry will reveal the possible future patterns of the Trump presidency, as Perry used the same method to reveal the actions and activities occurring under Presidents Bush and Obama. Perry explains how this method works only during major prophetic seasons. The book concludes with the chapter, The Battle Over the Temple Mountain. This new book is part of package offer RG123. Perry is also including on audio CD his two most recent prophetic updates, America's Leaders and God's Providence, and the CD, Wicked Spirits Controlling High Places. He will show you the two prophetic reasons for America's leadership being changed and the spirits assigned to bring down America. Order this new offer by calling toll-free 1-888-21-BREAD. That's 1-888-212-7323 or online at perrystone.org. You may also write us and enclose your donation of $30 or more to Perry Stone, P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee 37320. Request offer number RG123 when calling or writing. This offer is available for a limited time, so contact us today. We look forward to hearing from you soon.
Okay, we have uh, one more program that we're going to do next week, which will be our final offer for the book and the two CDs. So this is the time to get that book and CDs if you have not done so so far. As I've mentioned, it's not available in any bookstore, only available through our ministry. And 80% uh, of that book I've never written on before in 40 years of ministry. That's what, I guess that what, what, that's what makes me excited about it is because any time that we can present new and fresh information to people uh, where they learn what they did not know before, that's, that's very exciting to me, to uh, the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of God's Word. We all also uh, take this time to let you know some of the things that are coming up. Now, before I tell you some of the places we're coming to, well, let me just do that first. We're coming back to Texas at Family Faith Church, Willis, Texas, August the 18th and the 19th. It's a Friday and Saturday and Sunday morning. As always, we're going to go to Willis, Texas, the Family Faith Church, uh, Griffin First Encounter Live Church, Pastor Randy Valamont, August the 25th through Sunday the 27th. Uh, that's going to be a great meeting. We're going to be coming to Victory Christian Center uh, on Wednesday night. Only one service, September the 6th, in, uh, that's going to be in um, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Church Alive with Pastor Randy Long, September 15th to the 17th. That's going to be in Conway, Arkansas. Let me just encourage you to go to perrystone.org, look up our itinerary and see where we're going to be uh, coming to. Also. Uh, it's very important. Uh, we, we have uh, Facebook Live. You can follow us there. Twitter, you can follow us there. Periscope, you can follow us there. And if you want to keep up with the ministry and updates and events, and sometimes when there's breaking news, I'll get a little bit of information and put a commentary out there on that for people uh, to have better understanding. And that's uh, some of the ways that you can keep up with what we're doing. Uh, God has blessed us with uh, a, a great... Uh, opportunity, doors of opportunity that I have never uh, seen in my lifetime. When I was an 18-year-old preacher, my mama came to me the other day and she said, Perry, did you ever imagine when you were 18 years of age and you were preaching in those small churches in West Virginia, Maryland, and Virginia? And when I say small churches, the rural churches up in the mountains, she said, did you ever imagine that God would do all of this for you? And I said, no, mom, I did not. And sometimes people ask us, they say, is there a particular key? I don't think there's any particular key per se, other than total commitment to God, uh, being totally sold out to the love of the Word of God, studying it, preaching, uh, preaching, loving people, praying with people. But I do believe that part of it is just simply a calling of God. I do believe that there are people that God, uh, I don't have any idea what, what triggers this in the eyes of the Lord, but maybe He sees the generational background, the desire that they will have to use the gifting that they have for, for His uh, honor. And so I think sometimes that's, uh, that's what makes a difference. It's just, it's just the calling of God. And speaking of the calling of God, we are planning in the month of February, Dr. Cutshaw, who is over the ISO school, which will be our internet school opening up the first of the year uh, on the internet. Him and I are going to do a pastor's conference. It's actually not, for, I'm going to call it a minister's conference that anyone in ministry can come and be a part of. And I'll be telling you about that a little bit later on in the year so that you can plan for that. Anybody that's in the fivefold ministry is welcome to attend. We're not going to put any charge or any fee. We're going to have, it's not going to be a church growth deal. We're going to deal with issues that pastors are dealing with that they don't even want to talk about. And, uh, I, you know, I have a great love for ministers being a pastor's son. My dad was a pastor, and so we want to minister to you and all ministers, as a matter of fact, in the days ahead. See you next week. Bless you. Perry Stone invites you to join him for his 2017 Israel tour. The dates are November 20th through the 29th with an optional visit to Petra in the country of Jordan. Call 1-888-321-3629 or visit perrystone.org for more information and how to register. Seating is limited, so call today.